In the past 60 years, markets around the world have been through bubbles, liquidation, a global pandemic, regime changes, war, everything under the sun that you can think about the market has been through. But what has only occurred one time is a soft landing because it's a fine line with balancing growth, inflation and employment and having it all come together at the right time. And after the most recent data, the Fed may have just done that. So as we begin to thread the needle of a Goldilocks scenario, not too hot, not too cold, let's talk about what this means for stocks and financial markets. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Daily Recap Show. My name is Chase. We do these videos every single day talking about stocks and the financial markets. So if you like this video, hit that like button, subscribe to my channel so you don't miss out. Let's get into it. What a wild day for the market. I mean, everything was green apart from like the big healthcare names and Tesla. All in all, a green day everywhere from com services, energy, utilities, even financials. Apple didn't participate, but technology as a whole was green. They were on the up and up. They did post a positive day. Semis were very, very mixed. All in all, great breath across the board. But again, certain sectors, certain names lit up like Christmas trees, paper right there, bunch of a nothing burger. I said that in yesterday's video. I do think that this event was going to be a nothing burger. And that's why I didn't take a position. We are going to talk about when we will be taking a position in PayPal and what that means. I do think we're going to get to possibly like the mid 50s, in my opinion. Tesla down 12% rough day for Tesla as a whole and then Boeing as well. Looking at breadth as a whole guys, fantastic breadth, 402 gainers, 100 losers in the S&P 500 and here and just fantastic breadth across the board. Now what we really want to look for is follow through in breadth tomorrow in Friday's trade for the S&P 500. But looking at sentiment, we got the latest double A double I survey and 39.3% of members are bullish, 26.1% are bearish and 34.6% of you guys are very, very neutral, we could see that this is actually in line with the historical averages. Maybe the bearish sentiment is a bit lower than the historical average. From everything we're seeing right now, based on this, based on this, the sentiment is whatever position you're in right now, just hold and write out the gains for, you know, February, March, the rest of January. If you're holding positions from the October lows or any position from 2023, you're in a very, very good position right now. And we can see the same is true here with the NAM number. All this is, is the amount of US equity exposure active fund managers have right now 84.13 percent exposed to equities so they're sitting on about 15 to 20 percent cash and again even active fund managers sitting at this level right here you know the sentiment is probably just hold stocks you do want to be in equities and hold those equities looking at the majors very very interesting the rsp the equal weight up 1.01 percent guys great breath today i mean bonds put out a good day same with small caps 0.83 percent outperformed both the s p 500 and the nasdaq the NASDAQ was weighed heavy though by Tesla and what they did in early trade as well as having a fairly flat day in Apple. But all in all, a very, very good day across the board. This is what you want to see guys with the RSP and we do want to see follow through. And maybe we might rotate from leaders, tech, semiconductors, software into more of rate sensitive names over the next month into February, into March. But we really have to see follow through with this breath right here. This could have been a one-time thing like we've seen all throughout 2023, but I remain optimistic. Now, now, looking at sectors as a whole, look at what people are now buying. Energy up 2.25% today, 5% in the last five days. Home builders, GDX. Now, home builders were sold off significantly in the last five days. So this is sort of like a catch up trade. GDX right here. I mean, as rates come down, cash is less attractive. People are going to buy gold. It's just how the trade goes. Look at the worst performing sector though, discretionary. You know, you remove Tesla from this number and discretionary will flat on the day. Almost every single sector from about the 132 2 p.m. absolutely just like rallied off their lows. They sort of bottomed out around here. Why? It had to do with the bond auction. The seven year bond auction was very, very strong. I think what investors saw was we got the good data, GDP, PCE, durable goods. And then they looked at the bond auction and said, hey, it's a good time to buy bonds. Um, the economy is in good shape. And, and that's why the seven year auction was very, very well received. Looking at the actual data we got today. So durable goods came in really, really good. We got PCE as well. That came in at 2%, but it was the pre preliminary. We get the main number tomorrow as well as the GDP, we got 3.3% and people really did like this data. Something that flew under the radar and why home builders and real estate were bid today, new home sales change month over month in December, 8% increase. We did get pretty weak initial jobless claims, but the employment is at secular lows at the moment. And right now, growth is stable, unemployment is stable, inflation is around the target. This is a Goldilocks scenario. And we actually have to start asking the question, why is the Fed gonna cut rates? And that's what we're seeing um, in the rate market right now. Now, one thing to 
show is that FMS investors, 79% of them reckon we're going to have a soft or no landing, 17% in the hard landing camp. And this is what it did for rates, guys. Right now, we are pricing in a May cut. There'll be no March cut according to Fed fund rate futures. And this May cut may actually get pushed out to December. We are six to 12 months away from the first rate cut. And we could actually see rates rise in that time. Historically, when we're six months to 12 months out from the first rate cut, we do see yields increase 1% or 100 basis points. If we are six months away, it's anywhere from 25 to 50 basis points increase. It does not bode too well for equities. When the Fed does cut rates, equities normally rally if we don't get a recession. And it looks like we are on the way to a Goldilocks scenario. Anything can change with the data in a month or two. There is supply chain issues that are going to start affecting the data in January, in February. So we do have to be reactive to what the market is telling us. But as it stands right now, the data is good. Now guys, a big thing that's happening on the 31st of January is QRA and QRA has been a market mover. This is the S&P 500. We had a QRA missing expectations and we had this 10% sell off in the S&P 500 from June to late October. Then Helen said she's going to issue shorter duration right here. What happened? Absolute rally that we've seen all the way up to the 4,900 area in the S&P 500. And same thing with the 10 year yield, you know, QRA, we moved up. QRA was the mover right here. So on the 31st of January, that's when Yellen's going to do the next QRA refunding. We have to pay key attention to that and how it's going to move the markets. Now, something I want to talk about is the stock market as a whole has seen incredible strength in the last three months. And this is what happens when the RSI goes from 30 to 70 and the returns we can expect. Now, this happened on the November the 20th. And two months later, we have actually seen 7% gains as a whole. Median is about 2.6. Now, what do we normally receive? About 12% 12 months later. So in the next six months, we can expect another 5 to 6 percent gains just something to note there that according to this data right now we can probably expect more gains in the next uh three six and twelve months let's talk about earnings guys we got two of the bigger names we got intel and visa now intel's earnings were not that good i mean the guidance was poor and that's why they were sold off after hours now let's talk about visa this is what visa does an absolute cash flow machine so they had net revenue of 8.6 billion a nine percent increase year over year operating profit 69 percent margin on rail and then a 57% margin on net profit. And they're just a cash flowing machine. This is how they make their revenue. These are all of their expenses. You guys can go ahead, pause the video, have a look at all of this. But what's really keen for Visa is we have to look at what management say because Visa is a very, very good proxy for the consumer. And pretty much what we got, I showed you before, 9% increase in revenue, 69% operating margin and a non-gap earnings per share of 2.41, a beat on earnings per share. And one thing they did see was payment volume increase, cross-border volume increase, and they probably processed 9% more transactions year over year. One thing the market didn't like and why they were sold off 2% in after hours was they raised their expense guidance. But this is what I want you guys to pay attention to right here. And according to Visa, the consumer is holding in there. Our 2024 fiscal year is off to a solid start. In our first quarter, net revenues grew 9% and gap EPS grew 20% driven by relatively stable growth in overall payments volumes and processed transactions. Plus strong growth in cross-border volume, consumer spending remained resilient. Looking ahead, we continue to see significant opportunity across consumer payments, new flows, and value added services. So all in all, Visa's pretty much saying, hey, the consumer's strong. We're going to see growth, uh, fairly stable growth in the year ahead. And we probably are going to expect, you know, pretty much the same in payment volumes I would expect for Visa. This was just another tailwind for the consumer. And this is why the risk appetite indicator is above the zero level, but still below the one standard deviation. And all in all, you know, there is appetite for risk. And that's why we're seeing investment investors buy risk assets. Now, over the last year, and particularly in the last three months, we've seen absolutely crazy gains. Most of it has come from expansion in multiple expansion in the PE ratio. All that is, is simply the price increasing. And now we have to wait for the earnings to return. Now, normally the best years for markets are when PE significantly expand. We can see here that in 2023, we had a lot of multiple expansion, 24.2% return. That is the section right here. Normally what happens next is in terms of PE, this happens the likely range. We can get a little bit of multiple expansion, but normally we get multiple contraction because what happens is the P has increased. Now we get the earnings, we get the E and that drives multiples down. And then over the next year, we can then have another multiple expansion cycle and then earnings cycle. And that's generally what the market does. Now look, if multiples expand and earnings don't meet expectations, we sort of get what we had in 2022, right? Where uh, we, we get negative earnings 
earnings growth and then multiples have to contract stocks have to come down the p has to come down to meet the e now looking at consensus estimates up to right now so i believe this is up to monday what we're seeing is that 2024 estimates for the s p 500 is actually remaining stable so there's been no revisions downward there's been no revisions upward however the rty the uh, russell 2000 has seen very close to a seven percent decrease in revisions so let's say they were reporting a hundred dollars worth of earnings they're now going to report 83 that's what that means and not looking good for the russell 2000 and even though we have even though we do want stronger breadth across all of the indices unless smaller cap companies come in with better earnings it's going to be a really rough ride for them and i think one thing that small cap companies are really hoping for is rate cuts the second we get rate cuts this will probably increase quite significantly because we do know that 40 percent of russell 2000 companies are unprofitable and debt funded now looking at the s p 500 as a whole we are expecting the s p 493 at about a three percent earnings growth and the magnificent seven at 11 percent over the next four years after the revisions we've seen with tesla we really need to reevaluate this number because like 2024 guidance was moved up to like 2026 crazy i think it was like a 50 percent revision jp morgan is looking at uh not looking good for tesla investors and i do think the stock is going to continue to sell and we're going to look at the chart a little later that being said the most crowded trade right now is long magnificent seven and and the next one below that is short China and then long Japanese equities. So all in all, people are heavily reliant on Long Magnificent 7. And that's also because they have the biggest weight in pretty much all of the indices. In every every index or ETF, you will have at least exposure to probably two or three of the Magnificent 7 unless they purposely try to exclude them. Now, I showed you this chart yesterday. The geopolitical risk index increased 6% this week. And this is having a major effect on container shipping crossings. We can see here that the Suez Canal container shipping crossings has absolutely dumped and container freight costs are going to increase as a result and it's not looking good. There's definitely going to be some supply chain shock numbers we're going to see in the data for January and the data for February. So just be aware of that, that we may see, you know, some terrible data and this is something we need to understand as investors in the coming months. So when we do get these terrible data points over the next couple of weeks, if we do, do understand that a lot of it has to do with supply chain shocks. Let's talk about some data, presidential election year data so where does joe biden rank you can see here that this is when he was uh you can see this is his stats right here 21.4 percent increase in stocks the first two years in office average return is normally 28.3 and across all of the presidents and he ranks at number 11 right in the middle so he's not doing great it's not doing bad it's sort of very mediocre now let's talk about gamma uh, not much to say again uh core gamma resistance remains at this 4900 level and we are seeing the spot price sort of get to this level if the market really wants to rally ahead they need to break the 4900 level and it's been a very very tough task we've also seen strong resistance here at the 4868 level this is the s p 500 chart and we continue to march higher this chart looks very strong strong although momentum is fading right here but we did say the exact same thing at this point right here and then we did march higher a lot of what's going to happen next week is going to depend on earnings we have a lot of tech earnings com services earnings financial earnings too a lot of regional banks reporting which is really going to weigh on the financial sector as a whole but this chart looks strong there's no technical damage in the chart higher highs higher lows especially once we made the low here and marched up it's been very very strong very linear as well except for this double top situation but all in all we are still in the window of weakness and bears really had the opportunity in the last week week and a half to really bring this index down now looking at the five minute chart and this is what i'm talking about this 4870 4860 level is very very strong support and this 4900 level is strong resistance so we're sort of like trading uh, in this zone bears want to get below here and bulls really want to push above the 4900 level i think if we do push above 4900 the market's going to go up to 5000 for price discovery in my personal opinion but first we need to break above here use the support and then move higher looking at the equal weight and very very strong i mean we did go and make a higher high if you consider this the high but really we want to go and break this and all-time highs is 164 for the rsp and i think that's what the market wants to go do i think the market is going to go and attack 164 in the rsp while semis sort of remain flat while technology remains flat so we might just see like sideways movement in the s p 500 as earnings comes in and then upward momentum in the rsp if the rsp go hits an all-time high maybe we can then pull back that's going to be super 
super healthy and constructive for further price action into the future. But we also have to look at earnings. A lot is dependent on earnings. In fact, the entire market runs on earnings. Guys, again, I, I said this before, if bears really wanted to take action and move this index lower, the time was right now and they sort of are running out of time. This window of weakness is pretty much ending in a couple of days. And then we're gonna go back here where there's tons of dealer support of flows. And we do know that there's still a lot of positive gamma in the tape and that's gonna keep building. If there's positive gamma, more positive gamma is gonna build in. And that just probably means it's gonna be very supportive for further price action towards that 5,000 area. And if we're above the 4860 level by the first week of February, I think we do like a very, very strong run up to the 5,000 level towards the mid of February. And then maybe in the middle of February, we can look for some more sell side action. But Bears had their opportunity. They still do have their opportunity. Time is not on their side. And this is what I'm talking about. If we if we do stay above the 4860 level in the S&P 500, we probably run up to another half a percent, maybe 0.75%, and that'll take us to the 5000 level in the SPX. And then we can maybe look for some sell side. But if we do get below the 4860 uh, level and break some of the lows, especially in the RSP, the SPX, we're going to see what Tesla does for the NASDAQ and semis. If they, they just continue sideways, that could be bad for bears but bears need to act very very quickly they need to act tomorrow and they need to act in the first two days of the week next week otherwise we probably do go and touch 5000 uh, in the s p 500 now looking at energy guys let's have a look at some charts you guys want to know something right here that's when I told you guys to buy energy and we've seen like a 5% rally in energy so far. On the 11th of December, I said I've started building out an energy long position in these names. I think this whole portfolio is up like 5.8% so far. Crazy price action. You know, I bought pretty much every day all the way up until the 18th of January. It's been a very good run so far and I do think it's going to continue. One of my higher conviction plays is energy for 2024. Tesla, I showed you guys this chart yesterday. I had this line drawn up. This is exactly where we bounced off and anything below year and we're gonna see the 160, 150 level very, very quickly. Earnings not looking good for Tesla. And the thing is a lot was priced in. Tesla were pricing in years and years and years of earnings. I think we're gonna go lower. I think we might even go uh, test the waters at 160, maybe 150, somewhere in that range over the next couple of days. I wouldn't be a buyer of Tesla right here unless you really, really look long term and truly believe in Elon Musk. Now looking at XLC, XLC is ready to break out. I think we might see a rotation from semis into XLE uh, towards the end of January. I'm not talking about like a deep multi-month rotation. I'm talking about a couple of weeks, sort of like have semis go flat, XLC go higher. And that's because we had stuff like Google, Meta, all-time highs right now. This is an all-time high for Google. It, it broke that all-time high today. Kind of crazy when you think about it. And a lot of these uh, communication names are reporting next week. Now, looking at PayPal, I'm going to talk a lot about this in the weekend video. So subscribe so you don't miss it, guys. PayPal right now, peak the trough right now, that's 10%. It's below this trend line. And I think we're probably going to go lower. I put on uh, my Twitter that we're going to probably go hit the 55, somewhere in the 50s region. That's what I think we're going to go do for PayPal. I think it's going lower. I don't think it was very underwhelming. I think a lot of people wanted more. We wanted to see, in my personal opinion, I think what the street wanted to see was something like a no code checkout for Braintree, you know, really to go out and rival Stripe. We just didn't get that. We got like PayPal pretty much gave us like a, a rewards program and faster checkout, which is good, but should have been in the bank two years ago. But if you've made it up until here, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video. Cheers.